and right all you glorious gamers out there. Welcome to the Players 2 podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you or by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, that really, really, really helps us out. It is a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And while you're over there, if you could leave us a little review as well, again, that just helps us out even more. And you can review it on Spotify now, so why not be a double legend and go and review us over there as well. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, Mr. Lewis Camley. How's it going, Lewis? Going very well, Mark. Good to see you again. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. I got the COVID, Lewis. I got the COVID. There's no did. two ways about it. Mate, it <laughs> knocked me on my arse. Holy shit. I am so glad I am triple vaccinated because I would hate to have had that unvaccinated. Good grief. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Feeling much better, Lewis. Feeling much, much better. Let's talk about some goddamn video games and let's stop missing these episodes. I feel as since before Christmas, we've had stuttering all over the place, largely because I've been ill with one thing or the other, which I need to put an end to. So we're getting stuck in. And this, as well, is going to be a strange podcast because... Basically, since we've been off, I feel as though a lot of things have happened, but no, like, one enormous thing has happened, you know what I mean? Microsoft haven't bought anyone, nobody's fucked up on NTFs, you know what I mean? It's just a whole bunch of sort of small things that we need to cover, so Lewis, what we're going to do is have a big catch-up. It's the big players to catch-up is what it is. <laughs> so, instead of our normal format, we're going to break it for this week, and we're just going to try and hit as many things as possible that have happened over the past two weeks. A lot of stuff that we want to comment on, a lot of stuff's happened this week as well, to be honest, it's just a lot of small more things that we just want to touch upon. A lot of games released as well, Lewis, including that big one that I think you've been playing. <laughs> so I think we should get right stuck into it. All right, Lewis, starting off with the games that I've released since I've been off sick and I've not got to talk about any of them, which has been <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> First off, Lewis, let's just start with the big one, will we? Elden Ring has come out. It has some truly, truly ridiculous Metacritic scores. It has a 96 on PS5 and Series X. It has a 94 on PC, making it one of the best reviewed games ever ever and it was as high as 98 for a while and it was also in 97 for like a long long time as well it wasn't until i went to check to write these notes that i realized it'd come down another point to 96 but even still i mean it's just yeah, utterly i mean it's semantics at that point scores. isn't it <laughs> it really is it's incredible the critics absolutely love it but lewis you have been playing it we've not really spoke about this i, I want to know what you think i want to know what you think <laughs> i have been playing it indeed yeah i got it just a day or two after lunch and i never got around to playing it until the start of last week but I've been deliberately not texting you about it because I didn't know how fresh you wanted to go in. This quite to me, fresh, so yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> like I don't, I don't feel like I care very much about spoilers about it because, and Bloodborne is going to come up a lot in my discussion here. But for me, this experience is following hot on the heels of playing Bloodborne for the first time all the way through, as as anyone who's been listening for a wee while will know. And so all of my reactions are kind of based partly on my experience with Bloodborne and how much I loved that. Right, and the thing about my playthrough of Bloodborne was that I knew basically everything. Thing. like I was following guides I'd heard so much about it I knew the names of every boss I'd seen years worth of video footage and images and stuff from the game so to me there's this is quite a novel experience going into a from software game kind of blind and also without the support of limitless guides and YouTube videos <laughs> and all of that extra material which I I'm do sure actually there was think so much content for this game already uh, there will be regards. now yeah <laughs> certainly there will be now I worried that when I first booted it up there wouldn't be in and I haven't looked for it yet I really do actually value that way of playing from software games of using guides and because you're trying to find particular weapons or going for certain builds and you, there's a lot to know in fact you could even fuck up your ending by not following some of this stuff and I, I think that that is the case in this game as well similar to Bloodborne that there's sort of multiple endings and they've got very arcane ways of finding them and all that sort of stuff so I'm kind of in that zone at the moment of dipping my toe and feeling my way into it and I know that at some point I'm going to start looking up some of these resources and getting to grips with the game more but that's all the kind of background I've only played a few hours I haven't played tons of it yet Mark but I've played yeah the first three or four hours probably and done a lot of fanning about in that time I will say like a lot of just <laughs> running about getting killed not trying super hard just trying to kind of get used to it I guess my first point about it really is that the combat to me feels quite different from Bloodborne which is just a 
you know, a muscle memory that I'm having to work through. So the dodge is still on circle, but it works slightly differently than it did in Bloodborne. The the sword that I've started with just by chance with the class that I picked, it's much faster than the sword I was using in Bloodborne, but a lot weaker. And I'm trying to understand what kind of combos I should be trying to build with that. There is a jump button, which I don't know if any other from software. I mean, I guess Sekiro probably had the jump button, but... Um, yeah, Sekiro did. Secure. But this is uh, on X on PlayStation. There's a jump which you can use to attack. You can obviously use it for traversal and stuff as well. So there's, there's kind of a lot of that going on. And then there's the addition of magic, which again, the class that I picked has a default magic attack on the L1 trigger I'm not sure if every single class has that to start with I guess some will be more open to magic than others but kind of just trying to figure out how the fuck that works and like when to use it and you know <laughs> essentially it becomes a, a range attack but then you've also got shields which are not new to most souls players but of course there's no shields really or no shields that you would bother using in Bloodborne Indeed. and so they the, engender passivity yeah exactly <laughs> and so in, in this like there is that default need to block and to parry with the shield and get your timings right with all of that stuff so i'm saying all that to be like that has been my experience of the game really so far it's just kind of wandering around trying to get to grips with the core mechanics and kind of feeling my way into it i've cleared out one dungeon that was pretty horrible and it led to a boss at the end of it that absolutely kicked my arse like no, there was not <laughs> i just ran away from it in the end there was no chance i was getting close to beating it i mean i could barely land a hit i couldn't move fast enough to get away from it and i think that that's just a side boss i've not seen anyone else on twitter or anything even mention this character yet so i don't think it's like anything substantial that was like my first hour with the game i encountered all sorts of those wild from software moments where things suddenly just attack you out of nowhere that you weren't expecting i've had that moment that you will have seen in all the kind of trailers and promo materials where you're riding through this kind of wetland and suddenly a dragon just descends and clears out this camp in front of you like that's an image that's come up loads of times that has happened to me now there's so many things that i don't want to say to you and i don't want to say to the listeners just from you know tiny things but that you know you want them to be your own surprise when you get to it so yeah totally. i'm really enjoying it so far i'm really super excited to explore this world because it's fucking enormous and i do have my horse now that you have to take a couple of steps to <laughs> get a horse I get that horse naturally it doesn't tell you how to do that or anything but I eventually got that and that's really good fun because it kind of spawns immediately when you call for it so you can kind of <laughs> escape from battle really quickly if you need to <laughs> and you can attack from horseback which is another kind of fun twist on it also that's where I'm at just now. I'm going to be playing this forever. It seems like from all the review stuff and I don't think any of the reviews when they launched, anyone had finished the game at that point. And even now you can see on Twitter, like people are starting to come to the end of the game. They're talking about it being 80, 90, 100, 110 hours of content. And there's still people finding wow. then bosses and mini bosses that they haven't encountered. They might have even finished the game and then found other stuff. So this is colossal. There's so much to see and do and explore. And I'm really at the absolute foothills of this mountain of an experience that I think we're about to go on. <laughs> wow, sounds awesome, man. I've got to say, I'm very, very excited to play it, obviously. Yep. Bloodborne <laughs> is one of my favourite games ever. But, Lewis, I have not been playing that. I've been playing the next game, which also came out while we were away, <laughs> which is Horizon Forbidden West. Now, the last time we spoke, dear listener, was when the reviews had just dropped. And because I got sick very shortly after that, I had very little else to do apart from play Horizon Forbidden West. <laughs> and I've got to say, man, well, the most obvious thing about this game is that I think that it might be the best looking game I've ever played. It is truly, wow, okay. truly fucking beautiful. It is stunning. Possibly the best water effects I've seen in any video game. I would also say that it's some of the best side quests that I've ever played in a video game ever. They all feel meaty and their own story and also tie into the sort of wider story as well. They're just very well done, very cleverly, narratively brought together in a lot of cases as well. The world itself is just great to explore. Like, as you said, I have also been doing a lot of fanning about in this world, <laughs> just going around, exploring the places, clearing the map. It's been enjoyable and it doesn't feel like a chore, which I think is a, a nice point for a open world game to hit. Do you know what I mean? I target that Assassin's Creed often misses, I will say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do have to say as well, I don't think that this game gets enough credit for how fun and how varied the combat is as well. It's often really quite challenging and sometimes it can just get into like ridiculous situations where you're just getting mauled by three triceratops and things like that. And it's just it's just great. It's just great fun. I'm really enjoying it. It's a fantastic game. Having said that, 
My main complaint about the game is that Aloy will not shut up, Lewis. Oh my mm. god. She is constantly, constantly talking to you, telling you where you are, where you need to go, what you need to do. And honestly, it is sort of exhausting. And I don't understand that in this game. Like, just trust that the player gets it. Like, for example, you'll go into a room and then she'll be like, oh, those poles over there, looks like I can use them to get across the water. And it's like, well, yeah, obviously, it's the only thing here. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, trust the, the audience to get it. Trust that gamers will get it. And it's not because of, like, lack of good game design that these all these things need to be pointed out to you. Like, often they're very evident. Like, 90% of the time, these things are very, very intuitive things. There's no need for this to be explained, but... Oh, God, it, it can be quite exhausting, but it is a relatively small complaint on what is an otherwise very, very, very good game indeed. And the last time we spoke as well, like we were talking about the whole nonsense that was the review discourse around this. Mm. But see, to be quite honest with you, I would probably give the game a similar score to what it currently has right now, which is an 88. Yep. Having said that, I do think that this game has been quite unfairly criticised for simply not being Breath of the Wild. I think that that's bad criticism, really, because criticising something for what it isn't rather than for what it is isn't very constructive to me, do you know what I mean? I understand that because it's an open world game and because it has borrowed elements from Breath of the Wild, most notably the kite thing that you now use to get yeah. down off of high mountains that the first game didn't have, which was obviously borrowed from Breath of the Wild. And Breath of the Wild has been so influential in open world games. Of course, it's going to draw comparisons to that. It's natural, but... I do feel that it's been overly harshly criticised for that because otherwise it is just a fantastic, fantastically good game. It really is very, very good indeed and I very much enjoyed playing it. Good stuff. I mean, I totally expected that you, you would enjoy it and that criticism that you have of the over tutorialization in some senses i suppose the, the too much chat from aloy that seems to be the the main and lasting criticism that i've seen of it that's the oh, one man. thing that people keep talking about in fact i think i've seen people say that they've basically turned off or turned the in-game dialogue volume right down so they don't have to listen to it which i think is pretty telling i suspect that'll be patched out at some point quite frankly by gorilla but Lewis, i have to say man i need to say this right see if i have to hear aloy say one more time <laughs> when you're scavenging in a game yeah. where you're collecting a lot of stuff oh i can get that in my stash later yep i know aloy i've been playing the game for 25 <laughs> hours man chill <laughs> i have not played the game and i've heard that line so often just from other podcasters and other commentators all saying like oh my Shut god the fuck up, aloy. was it as big a problem in the first game was that a problem at all in the first game i don't remember thing? it being a problem no. in the slightest in the first game <laughs> it's an interesting one that because you, you have to look at it and go you know ghost of tsushima was another big open world game that sony put out and it didn't have any of that going on and it feels no, weird none that of that whatsoever that they've kind of, of went whatsoever. it feels like a backward step but i mean just really quickly a, a, a different studio and whatever yeah but yeah it was a bad decision frankly yeah i just wanted to say i totally agree with your point on breath of the wild and criticize something for what it tries to do not what it is not like and the same thing is happening with elden ring really where the discourse is going off in all sorts of directions around like why it should feel more like a ubisoft game there should be more on the map and all that shit and it's just with both of these examples and particularly when they get compared to one another elden ring and, and horizon which will be happening just now as well it's like they can just be different games they can be in loosely the same genre of like open worlds and be completely different and that is okay and people can enjoy them for different reasons absolutely and i have to say that both of these games are obviously open world games but i would say that that is where the similarities very quickly yeah, end with, between them <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen, another big game that has come out since we've been away has been Gran Turismo 7. This, of course, being another big PlayStation exclusive, currently sitting with an 88 on Metacritic, which is the same score as Horizon, coincidentally. But this also highlights the sort of absurdity and meaninglessness of review scores, because while I think that largely the comments around Horizon were very positive, critics were very positive about the game. It does feel as though Gran Turismo 7 has been received a bit meh, despite currently sitting on Metacritic with the same review scores, do you know what I mean? From what I have seen, the game looks visually great, it looks very impressive. And by all accounts, the racing in and of itself is actually really good, maybe great even, but there just seems to be a lot of like faff and extra stuff round about that getting mm. in the way of like actually doing the racing. I've seen more than one review say that like bad dialogue is getting in the way. I have to say that it's been a very long time since I've played any Gran Turismo game, ladies and gentlemen, I do have to admit that, but dialogue was not featured heavily when I used <laughs> to play these games. Like, it's over a racing game to have so much dialogue in it for 
that to be an issue seems like a weird mistake to make. Like, racing games shouldn't be dialogue heavy, in my humble opinion. They should be racing heavy. (laughs) Ultimately, I think, unfortunately, Gran Turismo probably remains squarely in the shadow of Forza, but seems to be, at its bones, a pretty good game. Yeah, it really seems like it's kind of hit those simulation goals again. You know, it's it's an unrivaled simulation game in some ways, but it does feel like Forza has a lot more excitement around it just now. And yeah, this thing of having these weird car freaks talk to you about cars the whole time in-game, that seems to be what this dialogue is. Like, there's very few things that I find less appealing about a video game than someone (laughs) just lecturing me on something that I don't really care very much about. So I can see why casual fans might not get too into it. But I'm sure if you were a big Gran Turismo fan over the years, it's got everything, basically, that you're looking for with this new instalment. Yeah, absolutely. Another game that has come out since we've been away on loose is Babylon's Fall, and oh boy, it has reviewed badly, real, real badly. It is currently sitting with a dismally low 42 on Metacritic. The main complaint seems to be that it's a bad game, Lewis. That seems to be the main complaint. It is dull, it is repetitive, and seems to lack any real identity whatsoever. Now, this is a Platinum Games game. And Platinum are constantly awesome at combat. Like, that's the one main thing that they're really, really great at. And even that seems to be very uninteresting. I know that Platinum as a studio seem to be branching out a bit here and trying to, like, expand themselves and trying to do, like, a lot of different things. But I sincerely hope that this is not a sign of things to come because that would be a waste of an otherwise great studio. Yeah, it's crazy. This is reviewed worse, I believe, than Balan Wonderworld, which was like the laughably oh, bad Jesus. game from last year. So, that, I mean, they've really done a shitty job here to, to have gone that badly. I'm not a big Platinum fan in the way that you are, but I am still surprised and quite disappointed at how badly this has turned out overall. Yeah, definitely, man. Really, really disappointing. Really disappointing. Such a good studio. Well, so Martha is Dead has also come out since we've been away. This is the game that PlayStation quote-unquote censored and that me and Lewis got into a huge argument about off mic, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the game has reviewed uh, with a 69 on PS5 and a 67 on Series X. It very much seems as though the game heavily relies on its shock factor and in reality its gameplay is much more in line with a walking simulator. In terms of the changes that were made in the PlayStation version, it seems as though the quote-unquote face-peeling scene and the womb-cutting scene are no longer interactive but remain in the game. Any mention of masturbation during the church chapter has also been removed. There is also an option in-game to cut like the gratuitous scenes as and when they come up, and there is a disclaimer at the beginning of the game that is now clearer and includes a warning to do with miscarriages, and I actually think that that's true along all the games, like on all mm. platforms. And there's also links being added to like mental health advocates and things like that for people who are like struggling with issues like that, which is just a nice nod, I think. And also, even at the beginning of the game, you can choose to, like, cut out the gratuitous scenes before you even start and whatever. So, Lewis, I think I have to sort of admit defeat here a little bit, because to me, I do think that this actually falls short of censorship. And I do think perhaps we all did, including myself, very much including myself in this, overreacted to what was going on in the internet at the time. Although I do have to categorically state that I definitely do not think that PlayStation should have forced the dev to make these changes. But I do think that it's really not. It really doesn't cross that line for me now, to be honest with you. Like, if all that stuff was completely removed from the game, then we might be having a different conversation. But if it's just some dialogue about having a wank then i don't really care about that do you know what i mean that can't be critical to the story surely <laughs> yeah it, it, it just better not be critical to the story <laughs> I, I i feel like sort of some of the points that i made the other week when we talked about this still stand that you know it comes down to this like why would stuff have been removed and to what end and and i think things like adding you know those kind of miscarriage disclaimers and stuff like that all of that is really important to making the kind of widest base of gamer feel comfortable playing stuff even though this is like a sure super and to be, to be clear like i told I agree with that. Like that should yeah, have of been course. in and the game from the get-go. No like suggestion. One hundred percent. dealing with a lot of that stuff. Definitely. Yeah. Category. It felt to me like when I read the ESRB's kind of breakdown of why they'd given it the mature rating or whatever that they had given it, there was enough in there to me to question whether it was crossing that boundary. And I guess that's what PlayStation has done. I totally agree. Like it's something to be cautious of if platforms and publishers can have the power to tell developers what to do. But at the same time, I do think you know there is a responsibility to 
to customers there. So it's a, it's a kind of a, a funny and interesting grey area, but one one worth exploring and one that I think probably ended up in the right place on, on this occasion. Glad that it's not full scale censorship essentially. But yeah, I can't imagine either of us are ever going to play this game. We'll never experience that ourselves. It sounds fucking grim and miserable, I've got to say. And yeah, I think it's maybe time we just moved on from Martha's Dead altogether. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, Lewis, fair enough. Yeah, definitely not my cup of tea, I have to say. <laughs> Also, Lewis, Triangle Strategy Reviews are now in as well, and it's currently sitting with an 81 on Metacritic. The game seems to have been received pretty well, I've got to say. Story seems to be good. Combat seems to be good. The tactical elements and whatever are involved in that seem to be good. The only drawback that I've seen on a couple is that the pacing is pretty slow in terms of the story and whatever, which, to be honest with you, was also true of Octopath Traveler, and I really like that, so that doesn't really bother me all that much. (laughs) But basically, you probably already know if you like this game like this, is a big meaty jrpg tactical turn-based combat like you probably already know if you like these things the way that this game is reviewed if you like octopath traveler or if you like games like this you'll probably like this one as well from my brief experience of the game the story seems much more wide and complex than anything that was going on in octopath traveler which is probably one of the main criticisms i had about Mm -hmm. octopath traveler so this is still very very much up my street i have to say though Lewis, i know that you like the tactical combat elements of this game but i know that you are often put off by the meaty rpg elements of (laughs) games thoughts on this Uh, yeah i'm still pretty intrigued by this i've got to say i was you know been paying attention to some of the review coverage and it seems like decisions really matter that the impact of your choices on your party have an effect on the world and how the story plays out which often is not really the case even when games tell us that's the case it tends to be that your decisions don't really count for very much sure yeah but i'm quite encouraged by that the combat side of things looks really good the tactical side it seems like basically for anyone who's a big fan of the kind of cult hit final fantasy tactics which i think a lot of people have always wanted more oh, of that yeah, kind yeah, of definitely that kind of thing is very heavily inspired by that very heavily totally so i'm going to give the demo a go i've potentially got some longish journeys coming up in the next few weeks that seems kind of perfect for a bit of a switch demo fest and if i like it at that point i might well grab this because yeah the the turn-based tactical combat i think is you know i feel like i've got to give a game like this a go every so often and octopath i thought looked beautiful but just wasn't really that interesting to me and this one maybe just will kind of push me over the edge so yeah Nice one, man. I'm glad to hear it. I think that this one will be way more up your street than Octopath, to be fair. Yeah. All right, Lewis, on to announcements and new stuff that happened while we were away. Again, we're just (laughs) firing through everything here. Lightning round the whole way. (laughs) First of all, Lewis, PlayStation have revealed the design of the PSVR 2. And Lewis, honestly... When you first showed me this, I thought this had already been announced because it looks exactly, exactly the way I was expecting it to look. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that I think that it looked bad or anything like that. In fact, I think it looks relatively good as far as these things go. It's quite difficult yeah, to get totally, yeah. a VR headset, if I'm totally honest. <laughs> but if you were to picture the PSVR 2 headset in your mind's eye, having seen those two controllers, you would be 90% correct. I can almost yeah. guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally, if you've seen PSVR 1 and you try and imagine PSVR 2 you're you're not going to be too far (laughs) off to be honest (laughs) the next thing Lewis the Steam Deck has finally launched albeit on a pretty limited basis if i'm completely honest but it does mean that we now have reviews and i think it's safe to say that in terms of performance it is very very positive indeed it seems basically as though we now have a handheld that's as powerful at least as last gen consoles but under certain circumstances under certain settings the steam deck is actually outperforming last gen consoles which is now handheld is just ridiculous it's in- incredible really which basically means that AAA games are essentially portable as far as i'm concerned now Lewis. yeah and while i think it is expensive obviously you look at the price of a steam deck and you go that is an expensive item and you're not wrong but i actually think for the tech that is actually in that thing in your hands i think that is a really competitive price really aggressive price really and i know that people who know much more about pc tech than i do also agree with that sentiment the main issue seems to be rather predictably battery life but again because you have so many options because it's basically just a pc you have so many options on what settings you want to play in what you want to do with your frame rates etc etc that you could very easily extend your battery life very significantly or destroy it in an instant you know (laughs) i mean (laughs) so it really really does depend and obviously it will vary really heavily from game to game as well 
I also heard more than one person say that despite it being significantly larger than the Switch, the Steam Deck is actually nicer to hold in your hand and nicer to use and isn't so carpal tunnel inducing as the Switch is, which is very, mm. very good for someone like me to hear, to be honest with you. Lewis, we have both pre-ordered Steam Decks. When that email eventually comes, do you still think that you'll buy one? Do you still think you'll pull the trigger? Oh, that is a good question. I think, broadly speaking, yes, for two reasons. I'm excited about the Steam Deck. You know, the, these reviews largely are really good. I want to kind of follow up on some of them and some of the, the negatives raised. There was this issue with stick drift, which seems sure. to have been, you know, called out by a few people and then quite quickly dealt with by Valve through a software update, which, yeah, we were talking off air. Neither of us really understands how you can solve that with a software no, update, but very we'll much see. seems like a hardware issue to me, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see what comes of that. So because of this funny rollout, there's not just every outlet doing their hands on review thus far. And so I still want to kind of see a, a wee bit more of that. The one thing that puts me off getting a Steam Deck is that my Steam library isn't huge because I'm not a massive PC gamer, whereas spending that money on an Xbox might make more sense in terms of access to Game Pass, right? But getting a Steam Deck, who knows if you reject that offer when that email drops. If we say no to that just now, who knows when we'll next get an opportunity to do it. So, oh, God, years. <laughs> yeah, so I think I'll probably just bite the bullet and then see how it goes, basically. But I'm really excited by the form factor. I'm excited by the performance that you were talking talking about and by how many games it's covering i mean portable gaming isn't really a big part of our lives still at the moment i don't really imagine that's going to change massively but just having a pc that i can play on the couch and in bed i think is actually the thing that excites me you know it's just another way to play a lot of these games that i love playing yeah man definitely definitely all right one of the weirder stories that has also come up with is that epic have bought bandcamp and for those that don't know bandcamp is an independent music storefront which thousands of musicians use epic has said that bandcamp will have an important role in building out a quotes creator marketplace ecosystem for content technology games art music and more whatever the fuck that means <laughs> bandcamp ceo has said that the core artist friendly deal for which they are known will not be changing in the near future but i understand that reactions to this purchase have been uh, tepid at best i will say lewis you know far more about this than me particularly with regards to Bandcamp. firstly what are your general thoughts here and secondly how do you think that this is actually going to affect gamers <laughs> good questions yeah I, I, i'm Overall thoughts, uh, it's baffling, to be honest. It's, it's such a, a weird left field decision and a, and a weird agreement, but you can see that Epic are obviously just trying to expand into as many markets as possible and particularly markets where they can sell stuff. You know, that seems to be a big part of yep. Epic's thing at the moment. I, I've seen it from the other side. I've used Bandcamp a wee bit. I have pals who are musicians are quite invested in the, the musical world and they're a bit more hesitant about it. I had one friend text me and say, like, what do I need to know about this Epic mob? <laughs> Basically, he's, you know, he's not a gamer. <laughs> Uh, and I can see why Fortnite. yeah that's the thing like I can see why they'd be concerned in an attempt to answer that question I basically was like in some ways they're really good they, they give an industry leading cut to developers you know that's been really positive and they've challenged Apple's hegemony and that's quite positive but at the same time you know they are the behemoths behind Fortnite and they are all about sales and the thing about Bandcamp is that it's been extremely pro musician in a world of like Spotify and all that taking a huge cut and not really paying anyone anything Bandcamp's been doing a thing I think through the pandemic where every Friday all of the money spent goes directly to musicians that they take no cut on a Friday or it's at least like the first Friday of the month wow. I find it quite hard to imagine Epic will maintain those things so we'll see how that pans out we'll see if people abandon the platform in terms of how it affects gamers going forward who knows I guess it's all about integrating music into Fortnite's products and vice versa so you'll be able to maybe buy music tracks from quote unquote Bandcamp but through the Epic Store or within Fortnite you can see all the music collaborations in Fortnite that's been a big thing for them so all sorts of ways it could go it's one of the strangest deals I think we've come across in a long time so we'll wait and see what happens with it but who knows yeah definitely a strange one it's very interesting to see what comes out of this basically and then <laughs> if anything <laughs> Another thing that has come up, Lewis, is that Amazon have 
quite quietly launched their game streaming service Luna in the United States. This is their competitor to xCloud and to Stadia, if we can even call Stadia <laughs> competition these days, let's be honest. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Luna was announced fairly quietly as well, and now is launched fairly quietly. I, I just don't know why Amazon aren't making a bigger deal about this, basically. But Luna, in terms of its monetization, works by buying channels, e.g. if you wanted to play, say, EA's games, you would buy their channel, hypothetically. They have now launched the Prime Gaming channel as well, which gives Prime customers access to free games rotating on a monthly basis. They are currently Devil May Cry 5, Observer, Fogs, Flashback and Immortals Phoenix Rising. They also have another channel called Luna Plus, which seems to be like the main channel, for lack of a better term. That's where a lot of the big games are. Control's there, RE7's there, uh, DMC5, as I mentioned, in isolation a plague tale this was just from like a cursory viewing that i had scrolling down the list of games that channel also includes indie games like katana zero blasphemous overcooked narrative boy again this was just from a cursory look but it is 9.99 which i'm not really sure is worth it they also have a family channel which is 4.99 all of this is in dollars by the way but that really had a lot of games i'd sort of never heard of before and the ones that i had heard of were like more co-op focused and things like that there's a similar retro channel which seems to be mostly capcom and snk games as so far as i could tell mm. which is also 4.99 there's a jackbox channel which is 4.99 the most expensive channel is ubisoft plus which is 17.99 to be fair, it does include all the modern Ubisoft games, really, like Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, all the Tom Clancy stuff, even new releases like Riders Republic and Rainbow Six Extraction. But ultimately, that one channel in itself is more than Games Pass. And I think that Games Pass has really ruined a lot of this for other people just by offering so much good value because, I mean, those channels are going to add up real quick if that is the model yeah. that they're going after. And really, I think to onboard people to this new service by this company that is not traditionally involved in the video game space like you really have to feel as if you're getting a good deal and onboarded well but it's just not there i don't think no i don't like this model at all i've got to say it seems like the costs will just stack up so i'm kind of not stunned they're not shouting about it yet but yeah i'm gonna steer clear of this for the time being at least yeah fair enough man fair enough Plus, another announcement that has come out while we were away was the announcement of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, which will be coming later this year, it seems. Now, before I say anything else, do you feel as though we have an oversaturation currently of Pokemon games lists? Uh, yeah, I would I would say so. I don't play them, but off the top of my head, that'll be the third sort of serious Pokemon game within a calendar or within a 12-month period, right? With the, the remix of Brilliant Diamond and Shine and Pearl on top of Legends Arceus. That's too much Pokemon, I would say. <laughs> Well, Lewis, I think that Pokemon has very secretly gone annualized because there has been a Pokemon game every single year since 2016. There was Sun and Moon, Ultra Sun and Moon. Then in 2018, it was Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Then in 2019 was Sword and Shield, which, by the way, I can't believe that came out that long ago. Mm. But then <laughs> in 2020, we had the DLC for Sword and Shield. Then, as you said, in 2021, we had Diamond and Pearl Remix and Pokemon Snap. And in 2022, we've already had Legends Arceus, and now we're getting Scarlet and Violet. I think it's actually trending towards two games a year, never mind being annualized. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I don't yeah. understand this direction, to be honest. I don't like it at all. You're heading towards Assassin's Creed oversaturation territory here or the problem that Call of Duty is having and Battlefield is having and just these annualised franchises are just stagnating. If you just get too much yeah. of them, you just get too much of this one thing and your ideas stagnate and it's just a bad, bad direction to be going in, to be honest with you. I thought Legends Arceus was going to be the big game this year for Pokemon. I was not expecting another one at all. This took me completely by surprise. And what is the saddest thing about it is that it does seem to be basically going back to the same old formula again. I don't know what it's going to be like in terms of its world. I don't know if it is going to be more like Legends Arceus or if it's going to be more traditional. But oh man, we've got to break the habit at some point here, guys. We really do. All right, Lewis, and just some other stuff. I've really been very creative with my headings when we've been doing this uh, catch-up here. <laughs> 
Nintendo have announced that they are closing the 3DS and Wii U stores in March 2023, but really they are cutting off access much sooner than that. In May this year, you will no longer be able to use credit cards in the store, and in August, you will no longer be able to use the eShop cards to add funds to your wallet either. This is always very sad to hear, I've got to say. I think it's been estimated that about a thousand games will just disappear forever when the store is closed, which is just incredibly sad. And the Video Game History Foundation, which is a charity that advocates for preservation of video games, has basically accused Nintendo of directly harming their efforts to preserve video games and i can see why they've taken that position i just think that it's very sad i think that all the platform holders need to do better here with regards to this and i also think that we as gamers like owe it to future gamers and ourselves really to just preserve the history of this thing that we love but sadly it's just not happening right now at all no, I totally agree with you there, Mark. It's, it is incumbent on all, all of us as kind of gatekeepers for the future of video games to preserve these things, and obviously Nintendo are particularly bad. Yeah, it just leads to a lot of good experiences and things that people could learn from. Future developers could be learning from these games and they'll never get a chance to play them if these disappear. So the quote it says that it is actively destructive to video game history, and I think that that is spot on, really. Yeah, really sad to hear. I always hate stories like these. I mean, the thing is, is that there's an understanding that it is no longer commercially viable to have a store for these games. That's fine. Yeah. That doesn't mean the preservation of these games has to go away, though. Another thing that came out while we were off loose was a report by Jason Schreier that there would be no mainline Call of Duty game in 2023. This would mark the first time Call of Duty missed a year (laughs) since 2005. Talking about annualised games, this is perhaps the king of them all, apart from FIFA. (laughs) Mm. Mm. Instead, Activision will be focusing on delivering content for the up-and-coming Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2 in 2023. Obviously, this comes in the face of the Microsoft purchase, but apparently this decision was made independently of Microsoft. And, of course, it comes in the wake of the ongoing sexual harassment scandal at Activision and new reports that they are struggling to hold on to staff, very unsurprisingly, considering the culture there. But most notably, Lewis, it comes in the face of underwhelming sales numbers by Call of Duty standards for Vanguard. I have to say that this decision might have been taken outside of Microsoft's influence. We will never really know that. But if that is true, I think they might be jumping before they are pushed here, to be honest with you. Outside of a few titles here and there, I think Call of Duty has been flagging for a long, long, long time. I think this is a welcome decision. It would be great to see them refocus and try something new, try something to sort of reboot the franchise in a real meaningful way. Just don't keep remaking all the Modern Warfare games. I think that's exactly what they need to do. I mean, it's no secret that I'm not a big Call of Duty fan particularly, but if they did take a step away and reboot it and rethink it, I mean, I don't really think they'll go that far, but they can just tighten it up and kind of give people that sense of excitement back about it. And it's not like people won't still get their Call of Duty fill because the old games are still there, those servers are still active, and of course Warzone is there for people to get that kind of Battle Royale hit. So they shouldn't really lose out on it, but if they just give all their studios like a year's break, just (laughs) think about it, work out what they need to do, I think it's probably for the best for the series and for the whole like first-person shooter genre generally because it creates a sense of stagnation, I think, when these things are too uh, rapidly released. Yeah, definitely, categorically, yeah. All right, Lewis, and this is by far and away the bit that I was least looking forward to when we were doing this, and by far and away the biggest thing that happened while we were off was uh, Russia decided to invade Ukraine, and I think that we would be remiss if we didn't at least mention this horrific situation and how it was affecting the games industry. Now, obviously, obviously this situation is absolutely awful, it's horrific, it goes massively beyond our tiny little area of video games, do you know what I mean? I no way want anyone to think that we are underestimating the situation or misunderstanding the situation. We understand it is incredibly severe. What is happening now is going to have repercussions, harsh repercussions on all our lives, to be honest with you, but none more so than the people in Ukraine who are fucking dying in their own streets, running from their own homes because of a baseless, pointless fucking war. Having said that, we obviously are a video games podcast and we talk about how things like this affect our little bubble in the world. So 
I have to say as well that I actually think that on the whole, it has been quite a positive response from the video games industry. A lot of studios have been doing various fundraising things for the humanitarian effort in Ukraine. We retweeted a statement by 11-Bit Studios who make this war of mine, who said that they would be donating the profits for the next seven days to the Ukrainian Red Cross from that game. But just to name another few, and I know that there's loads and loads of stuff going on, I couldn't possibly name them all, but some of the standout headlines to me were that the Pokemon company had donated $200,000 in humanitarian support to Ukraine. Sony have just announced that they are are donating $2 million to various charities to aid in humanitarian efforts in Ukraine. CDPR have halted the sales of anything on GOG and The Witcher 3 in Russia. EA have halted all sales in Russia and Belarus and have removed Russian players and teams from their various sports games. The Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister has even called out directly to Xbox and PlayStation to temporarily end their support in Russia. PlayStation have halted the sale of Gran Turismo 7 in Russia. Nothing more on that yet, I don't think. But Microsoft have now said that they will stop selling their products and services in Russia as a whole. One of the saddest stories to have come out of this from a video games perspective is that Stalker 2 has now been put on hold. This game is made by GSC Game World, which is based in Kiev. They have stated that they are now striving to help our employees and their families survive, which is a truly harrowing statement for anyone to have to put out, let alone a video game company that should have to be dealing with any of this. I mean, it's all very bleak, unfortunately, but I think that the video game's response to this on the whole has been good. Look, you can always do more. Of course you can. But I'm glad that there is a strong response from the video games industry. It's also very easy for anyone in the world to feel powerless in situations like these. But I would say that if you can give anything to the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, then I would urge you to do that in any way that you see fit. Something that I think would be great for our listeners specifically and something that I think that me and Lewis are both definitely going to do is that there is a huge bundle of nearly a thousand games on itch.io that has been put together that if sold individually would be worth over $6,500 and they are only asking for a minimum donation of $10 and you get all of those games and all of the proceeds go to help uh, Ukrainian charities and to help with the humanitarian crisis. Some of the games in that include Celeste, Super Hot, Baba Is You, Minute, Terrorfall, and those games alone, alone are worth way more than $10. So it is a fantastic deal for you as a gamer, and you're helping out some people who really fucking need it right now. They have also raised over half a million dollars already, which is just incredible. And Lewis, I'm sure that you remember that itch.io did a similar thing around the BLM movement when that was all kicking off and whatever, and we also bought that bundle as well. And I think at the time that we said that we would choose a few of those games to do as play-along games, but basically, I think we both kind of forgot. So I think that we should commit now to saying that this year we will play a couple of those games on that bundle as part of our play-along series. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah, um, or just you know, generally play a couple and just talk about them at the top of the show as well. I think would be good because there's like you sure, say, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- there's tons and tons within there, and also it just also shouldn't matter to you what is in that bundle. Like if you've got some money to chuck in this direction or in any direction, I went to a local bake sale the other day that was giving money to Ukraine. You know, give and do whatever you can. This is a fucking horrendous situation. It does obviously go far, far, far beyond the effects on video games, but like you say, Mark, this is what we're here to talk about it's devastating for the the teams behind stalker 2 and i think some other teams who have you know one or two members of staff or whatever oh, still sure, they're, in they're, Ukraine not, as they're well. not alone it's yeah it's just an absolutely horrendous horrendous situation all solidarity to the people of ukraine and fuck vladimir putin and yeah let's just hope that some kind of resolution of this is coming in the not too distant future yeah i very much hope so but i'm not holding out much hope at the minute i have to say <laughs> but lewis yeah. We do not end on downers. Unfortunately, we got some good news just before we started recording. (laughs) PlayStation will be holding a state of play on Wednesday. And while that is unfortunate for us because Wednesday is tomorrow as we record this, but it will be yesterday as you are listening to it. So you, dear listener, will know how that state of play went. But I hope that it's good. It will be 20 minutes long. Apparently, it will be focusing on Japanese publishers 
PlayStation only have two Japanese publishers, First Party. One of them just released Gran Turismo 7, and the other one is a Sobe team. And while I would love, 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 love a proper Astrobot game, I don't think that we're expecting an announcement of that. <laughs> so I would be expecting a lot of third parties here, which is pretty exciting as well, particularly if you're in Japanese games like this guy is. <laughs> yeah, I'm not... I'm not holding my breath for this one. Hopefully, by the time everyone's hearing this, there'll be plenty to be shouting about. But uh, yeah, I'm not expecting a great deal, to be honest. For me, at least. <laughs> Fair enough, me. man, to be honest. Yeah. Me neither. But I didn't want to end on the UK no, no, crisis. No. So Absolutely here we are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and Lewis, we got through our big catch-up. We got through our big catch-up and we're only a little bit late. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think it's time for a beer and then we will be back for Topic of the Week. And we are back for Topic of the Week. Topic of the Week this week is our play-along of Abzulus. It is indeed, Mark, yeah. And and we might try and keep this one fairly tight because it's been a bit of a, a whirlwind show and also this isn't a very long game. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I assume we'll be talking about it a wee bit more with next month's game, which we'll come on to in a bit anyway. But yeah, this month we've been playing Abzu, Mark. That is the first game from Giant Squid Studios, which was set up by director Matt Nava after he left that game company where he worked as the art director on Journey. Journey is a game that we will be coming back to in the course of this discussion. I think a lot of Giant Squid's team came from that game company originally as well. Abzu was made by a team of around 13 people, including the award-winning composer Austin Wintery. And it's a it's an adventure game set pretty much entirely underwater, which is you play as a diver exploring the remnants of I guess some kind of mysterious, possibly ancient civilization that is now submerged beneath the sea, and you are essentially trying to bring life back to the ocean or something like that. It's never explained exactly what it is that you're doing, but you've just kind of to infer from your actions and the impact that you're having on the world what's going on. Um, It was developed over three years and released in 2016 to pretty strong reviews for what is a short, relatively action-light indie game. It naturally drew a lot of comparisons at that point to Journey, um, which again, we'll, we'll talk about a wee bit more down the line. And it set the company up to release their second game, which also happens to be our next play along game the pathless in 2020 again i think we'll probably touch on this game a wee bit more next month when we talk about the pathless because that is a bigger game and a more expansive game than this but abzu overall thoughts mark what did you think playing this one what a great little game this was <laughs> that's that basically what i thought also i did not know that austin wintry did the soundtrack for this yeah and yeah. i was going to mention how good the soundtrack was <laughs> <laughs> it is really really good in certain points like it really knows when to swell and make it feel like a journey it's weird that music can do that (laughs) it can make it feel like a journey also the word journey will be coming up a lot as well because (laughs) i sort of felt like that's what the game felt like it felt as though you were just going on a sort of adventure effectively underwater adventure you know no i really liked it actually for what it was i mean honestly under two hours i think it took me to do it I pretty much it yeah right around the two hour mark but i i think you could easily do it in an hour if you wanted to to be totally honest i really really enjoyed it i really enjoyed it absolutely did not overstay its welcome it was cheapest chips when i bought it if i even bought it i might have got this for yeah. free at some point as well to be honest. <laughs> i think you can probably get this for like three pounds or less here and for that two hour experience just do it it was just great It was just great. It costs less than a fucking cup of coffee in some places, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I think that's the thing. To start off, it's it's obviously a really... It's a simple premise. It's a simple game. It's a short game. And, you know, you might struggle in some cases to recommend a game like this to a lot of people based on the cost of it or whatever. But this game has been out for a while. I don't think it is very expensive, generally speaking. I'm pretty sure I either, like you, got it for a couple of quid or basically free as part of some bundle or whatever. And, yeah, it's essentially like a little tech demo in some ways. I think, you know, it's kind of giant squid showing off what they were starting to learn about movement and about kind of storytelling through unconventional means you know there is no general storytelling in this game it never really jumps up and says this is what's going on you're just kind of no led to believe certain things or, or kind of showing certain images that you might then kind of make decisions about but for that i would totally agree with what you're saying it's, it's simple and effective and for a sort of 90 minute to two hour experience it really doesn't put too many feet wrong i don't think no it, it really doesn't and as you said i think that we'll talk about this probably a lot more on the pathless i am sensing although you can tell me if i'm wrong here but <laughs> it feels as though this was them trying to find their feet of like naturalistic storytelling of not having a map just exploring and finding your way and finding the story finding the path as well 
on that journey feeling very very naturally and i think it is testament to how well the game is designed as well despite it being such a short experience is that you never feel lost you never question where you no. have to go it's always no. evident despite the fact that it feels as though you're exploring you feel as though you, you are going on this journey and it's your own you never feel lost which i i really think is great and is hard work to do do you know what i mean to lead a, a player through a game like that the way that you want them to but for it still to feel open and free is very good for what is a very short game and a very small studio as well the comparison to journey is so clear it's, it's so clear However, I didn't know that the team actually came yeah. from that studio. Like, I didn't realise that it was a sort of spin-off from that game company. That seems to be almost the genesis point of this game. It seems like Matt Nava, who, as I say, was the art director on Journey, kind of basically didn't want to work with sand anymore. And apparently he himself is a big scuba diver in, in his real life. You know, that's one of his big hobbies. So I get the feeling he just wanted to... In, in some ways, it's maybe a slightly self-indulgent game in that sense, but it was kind of him going, I can do that same kind of story, but in this big, expansive underwater environment. And I do think it is a bold move for a new studio an indie studio to set a game entirely underwater i don't know how often mark we would say underwater sections are <laughs> routinely the worst part of any video game um i actually I, I need to remember Always. to ask you about the underwater sections in horizon next week when we're doing uh, what we've been playing <laughs> i've been meaning to ask you that but yeah fine. what They're did fine. you think of that <laughs> what did you think of that generally did the I, w I was certainly worried before i started playing that it was going to be awful and i didn't think that it was what was your take um, weirdly, I thought, so towards the end of the game, there are certain wee bits that you have to get out of water, and I mm -hmm. didn't like those sections. I wanted to be in the water. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, I don't know how they they made me think that way, but yeah, I have to say, yeah. look, I thought that my control of the character was tenuous at best i have to say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the, the controls were underwater controls i mean they, they can be difficult to orientate i actually ended up turning the invert of the camera off but leaving the invert of the swimming on which made it feel a thousand times better to me and if someone is playing this and is struggling with that which it makes a lot of sense for for someone to walk in here to me anyway and sort of think oh the, the controls of this are horrible and whatever like see honestly if you make that tiny change i guarantee it will make everything so much easier moving forward although i Good understand stuff, that you didn't yeah. turn it off and you just sort of persevered the way it was and found just it kind of right. persevered yeah. yeah but look the mechanics were underwater mechanics sometimes i felt as though i didn't have massive control over where I was where I was wanting to go however the game sort of like nudges you along in the right direction is enough that you can always sort of get your bearings and find your way do you know what i mean it's never really a problem and i think that the length of the game really benefited this as well because i think that if you had to play even a six hour game an eight hour game and anything beyond that yeah those mechanics would have overstayed their welcome and would have become quite tedious but because of the sort of game that it was in the short sort of quick snappy beautiful experience that it was very zen very low intensity gaming which i do like yeah it, it worked it worked they, they totally worked they totally worked for what the game was yeah i agree with that totally it wasn't always the easiest but the the swimming mechanics never really got in the way of that zen feeling you know what i mean no. there was times where it was frustrating but no, no, i've I definitely even say played it was frustrating, far worse but i was just sort of like oh i don't know where i'm going but i wasn't like i was never angry yeah. at it do you know what i mean no um, it's a difficult game to be angry at <laughs> that, that's totally i mean it is so zen well let's touch on that as well because they are direction in the world the, these beautiful colorful underwater environments mm. that are like bustling with sea life it seems to all be based on on real fish just kind of simplified yeah, versions yeah, of them definitely. the addition of those kind of optional meditation points where you could kind of sit on top of these statues and just cycle through the sea life i mean it's just a very enjoyable calm space to spend time in obviously supplemented by austin winter's soundtrack which uh, really lends itself soundtrack. to I that as well I mean, that guy's a fucking genius <laughs> <laughs> No, it wasn't. No, it was great. I mean, you can literally meditate in the game, so I think you can sense what they were going for. <laughs> um, yeah, his soundtrack, everything, it all just culminates. And the world feels, although in reality it's probably a very small game and a very small map and a very small world, it feels big. A lot of the time it feels as though you're like a yeah. tiny speck in, in this ocean, do you know what I mean? Absolutely, it, it, really, it, does, yeah. it just works. It just really, really works. It is there are a few like really short game experiences like that and, and journey wasn't a long game experience but it was longer than this but, like thinking of florence or something like that obviously very very mm -hmm, different mm -hmm. but that just nails what it's trying to do it takes the amount of time that it takes to do what it's trying to do whether it's tell a, a sort of short narrative or give you this sort of calm 
soothing little journey in the water like whatever it was like it does what it needs to do it does it well and then it goes like it's not bothered about yep. trying to fill eight hours of game time or whatever like it's just it just totally. wants to be what it is and what it is is really good <laughs> i thought that was the thing you know when i realized that there were collectibles and and those meditation points and these kind of hidden wells and stuff that you could find i was a little bit like oh god do i actually want to do all of this because it feels like added stuff that doesn't really benefit me as the player but then about halfway through the game i realized like well yeah you can just if you're enjoying a certain section just swim through it and like get to the next bit or if you want to stop and kind of look at this biome because i think that is the thing as well the the reason that you feel tiny and it feels like a bigger world than it actually will be is that they do a great job of varying those those sections you know there's kind of coral reef sections there's a really beautiful scene i thought where you dive deep down alongside a blue whale yeah the whale and you know you can't it's semi-cut scene like you can't really move away from that but you just you go deeper and deeper and then all the fish become like really deep sea creatures as well like i thought it did a great job of varying what could have just been a big old fucking blue map you know basically so i was really impressed by a lot of what it was doing just to finish off mark i wanted to touch on that journey comparison again you've played journey all the way through you mentioned that it's a longer game i've never actually finished journey and it will probably do it as a play along one day for that very reason oh we definitely should <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that this adds anything that journey isn't doing is it sort of substantially different enough from journey to kind of merit its place i'm just conscious that it is a game that has basically spun out of journey and is it just journey but underwater or do you think it's got enough going on on its own no i think it's got enough going on on its own definitely i mean it, journey but underwater is no bad thing it's no bad premise for a game but i don't know <laughs> but i don't think as well that it's because it's added anything if anything it's because it's taken things away it is just the journey do you know what i mean like there are yep. other elements to journey the game that aren't just traveling and, and this game sort of is just traveling and there are a few little puzzly things here and there but i mean in reality it's just exploring a world and sort of going on a little adventure and i, I suppose journey is like that yeah. as well. it almost feels like journey in its purest form do you know what i mean totally it, it really yeah. was a, a, a fantastic little game for what it was yeah i really enjoyed it really relaxing experience and to go away from fighting robot dinosaurs to that for a little while yeah. was actually quite nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah I maybe save a, a second playthrough for when you're playing Elden Ring in that case. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. I, that could be it, you know what I mean? Because it takes so little time to play it. The only other thing I was going to add was that the only real other character in the game is the shark. And even that yeah. is, is done great, where basically the thing is, is that the shark is basically going on the same journey you are. And yep. you, you continually think it's an enemy, and maybe it is, but then you sort of save it and whatever, and then it sort of dies, question mark, at some point, but then comes back to life, and then everything sort of... It was just a yeah. small <laughs> emotional roller coaster within this tiny little game. I was like, oh, I hate this shark. Oh, I love this shark. Yeah. Oh, the shark's dead. I'm really sad. Oh, it's back. I'm so happy. <laughs> it's <okay. laughs> but it was, and honestly, in a lot of what you felt in those moments was the score. Like, a, a lot of it was that. Do you know what yep. I mean? It, it all pulled together so nicely from so many directions, from the art style, from I mean I'm not even going to say that's narrative it's just it's just a, a little emotional cue basically throughout the journey yeah. you know what I mean but it, it just worked it, it just worked it was just a great little very very small experience that just totally worked and as I said it was a very pure experience that didn't it didn't need anything else it didn't want to be anything else no. and it wasn't and it was great it was really good <laughs> <laughs> perfect all right ladies and gentlemen I think we'll have to call it a day there I'd like to remind everyone that you can find players too on all the social media that is Facebook Twitter YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P L A Y E R S T O O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, that really, really, really helps us out. It is a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And while you're over there, if you could leave us a little review as well, again, that just helps us out even more. And why not be a double legend and give us a review on double Spotify legend. as well, Lewis? <laughs> and now it's time to introduce our next play along game I say introduce as if I've not mentioned it multiple times it's the pathless it's the next game by Giant Squid Games very much looking forward to playing this one to be honest with you I wanted to play Abzu just as a sort of prelude to getting to the pathless the real goal here was playing the pathless but man I'm so glad that I played Abzu and it's really got me excited to go and play the pathless now if I'm totally (laughs) honest it really has 
Good stuff. Yeah, I've played the Pathless before. I probably talked about it on the show because I played it oh, right when I first have. got my PS <laughs> PS5. Yeah, not a spoiler to say that I enjoyed it, but we'll obviously save deeper discussion for down the line. But I'm really pleased with how you've reacted to Abzu with that in mind. But it's a bigger game for anyone that wants to play along with us. It's it is more like eight to ten hours. It's bigger, much more expansive world to explore, but it's got really fantastic traversal and kind of speedy movement in it, which it makes it a really fun, still quite zen chill game to play. Nice one, man. Yeah. Yeah, the, the movement and stuff like that in the game is definitely a selling point. Looks utterly fantastic yeah. as well. Really stylistic, great style. And Austin Wintery does the soundtrack for that. I didn't know that one. Exactly. Didn't know he did this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we will see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.